Hello, hello, my dear friends. Welcome back to DLD Sync. It has been a while since we've connected. For those who haven't been tuning in into DLD Sync for the first hour now, a very warm welcome to the DLD community. I'm Steffi, Steffi Czerny, founder and managing director of DLD. DLD is a global community that explores how our world, our businesses is changing alongside technology. We bring together technology experts, entrepreneurs, business executives, scientists, philosophers, journalists, and artists, very important artists, for an interdisciplinary dialogue about the future of the world. Our motto is always connect the unexpected as I believe it's important to look at the ch challenges and opportunities of our ever-changing world from many diverse perspectives as possible. That's why DLD Sync today is a perfect fit for DLD, cybersecurity and diversity. Again, cybersecurity and diversity. I, I doubt that many of you have heard about this topic before. Countless cyber attacks are happening every day. The attacks and hacks that make it to the news headlines are only the tip of an iceberg. They threaten critical infrastructures. They invade our privacy. They steal intellectual property. They cost us billions of euros and sadly, even lives. So I think we all can agree that cybersecurity is one of the most pressing and important topics in our connected digital world. It's not a one-hit wonder. It's only the beginning. Because if we don't get into it, we can't feel safe. We need to be aware of it every day, every minute. We have to work with it. But what are the most eminent points when defining and planting a cybersecurity strategy that works at every level of an organization? So I'm so pleased to welcome two experts, real role models in their field here today. They will not just give us an insight um, about the most important topics in cybersecurity. They will also focus on the particular questions of why diversity and common values are so important weapons in fighting cybersecurity, cyber attack. So, so please welcome. For the first time on DLD stage, but I tell you, not the last time. Natalia Ropesa, Chief Cybersecurity Officer and Chief Diversity Officer at Siemens. Technology leader for products and services in the fields, industry, infra infrastructure, mobility and healthcare. My God, Natalia, that's quite a lot <laughs> on your shoulders. Zena Sakur, Vice President and Global CTO for Digital Security at Atos, a globally leading company for digital solutions that power a large variety of industries. Super two role models. Thank you for coming. Natalia and Zena will be in conversation with, with our longtime friend, Jennifer Schenker, a well-versed technology journalist who was writing about tech for the Wall Street Journal, the International Herald Tribune, Business Week, and more before tech became mainstream. Remember, we met at Red Herring. I would, Red Herring, this was 96 or so. 96, yes, absolutely. long time ago, but a good time ago. So we know each other very long. Jennifer is based in Paris and is the founder of The Innovator, an online news site and a newsletter that focuses on tech innovation and sustainability. I really recommend for all of you, my friends and listeners and viewers, to subscribe to it. It's really worth doing it. So, Jennifer, Natalia, Zenia, the floor is, is yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, so let's, uh, as, as Steffi mentioned, we're going to talk about cybersecurity and, um, and later on in the discussion about why it is a matter of diversity and values. Let's start with an overview of the cybersecurity landscape. Um, most of us have seen the headlines. Uh, JBS, the world's largest 
meat processing company with headquarters in Brazil and more than 250,000 employees worldwide, announced in May that it was the target of an organized cyber attack, illustrating once again that ransomware is an urgent national and international security issue. JBS facilities in Australia, the US and Canada were disrupt disrupted, causing some plants to shut down and workers to be sent home. The attack uh, followed another one in April uh, on Colonial Pipeline, and that attack halted fuel distribution from a crucial pipeline on the East Coast of the United States, leading to a spike in gas prices, panic buying, and localized fuel shortages in the Southeast. That's not all. As Steffi said, these are only the tip of the iceberg. There's been a whole slew of other ransomware attacks that don't always make international headlines. The Cyber Peace Institute has just put out a report that says that there have been 116 ransomware attacks on healthcare facilities, such as hospitals, in 24 countries in the past 12 months. Systems were shut down for as long as 113 days. Ambulances had to be diverted, surgeries delayed. At least one death, that of a baby, has been directly linked to hospital IT systems being shut down by malicious hackers seeking ransom. So against this backdrop, I'd like to ask our panelists, beyond ransomware, what other types of cyber attacks and risks are organizations dealing with today and what do you see as the impact? Uh, Natalia, would you like to start? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Jennifer. So you see, I mean, the, the, I know that the ransomware attacks, they sound very critical and they are in fact, uh, basically a, ran, a ransomware attack happens because the attackers are looking for money. So they encrypt the data of the different victims and they re request the money in exchange uh, to decrypt the data so that the victims can uh, resume operations, whether this is the operation of, uh, uh, of, of uh, energy provision or the operation of a hospital. Now, there are other motivations, and those motivations are my nightmares. Um, uh, the ransom word is is very noisy because they would they would affect the availability of the systems you mentioned. They were shut down, mm -hmm. but there, there are other motivations like stealing uh, intellectual property. So in, in those those kind of attacks, the attackers will would like to remain silent. Uh, very silent because if they remain silent, they can steal the data they want and they can steal as much data as they want. So those attacks are very difficult to, to detect. And there is evidence actually that some companies, they, they take like 18 months, 24 months in order for them to discover that they are having such an attack. Those, those attacks are called APTs. APTs stays for advanced persistent threats. Okay. Now, uh, and those are basically affecting the confidentiality of the data. Um, there are other kind of attacks uh, that are affecting the integrity of the data. And to give you an example about how important integrity of the data is, is I would say, let's talk about medical records. So, mm -hmm. or sure, my medical record has something like, uh, am I allergic to penicillin, yes or not? And, 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 and if it's yes, then... I don't want this information to be changed to no, because that will have big consequences into my health. So then are, there are other types of attacks that are uh, targeted to manipulate the information and to damage the integrity of the data. So I will stay here because otherwise I, I will go, I will, I can speak forever about this. But, but to your question is, Ransomware is only one type of attacks. There are others more silence, and, and in addition to that, there are others more dangerous than, than ransomware. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me turn now to you, Zena. Um, you know, would you consider, for example, um, state-sponsored attacks as part 
part of the problem? And what about disinformation campaigns? Um, can that also be consider considered a kind of cyber attack? Yeah, so, you know, when we're talking with the set actors, the cyber criminals, we have different categories, you know, you have the hacktivists, so they are doing it for a cause. Um, and you have the cyber criminals, so really, it's, uh, they are there for the money. Mm -hmm. And it's a very lucrative business. So um, if you think about it today, you can subscribe to an attack as a service. You don't need to have any expertise at all. You go to the depot of the dark web, you subscribe, and someone will launch the attack for you. And for some, you will pay on the result. So this is how confident they are. And those hurt because those are very motivated. When money is behind it, you know that they will continue on doing this type of attacks. And the ransomware attacks are one of the, the examples uh, around that. And indeed, um, nation-sponsored attack, uh, they are a big problem today because usually, not all the time, but usually uh, what Natalia was referring to, the advanced persistent threat. So those type of attack that remain unnoticed, they are, they're doing it in a stealth mode. They don't want you to know that you are under attack because they want to go get your critical data your R&D data, your asset, your customer data, end user, or what have you, and then be able to leverage this data. And this type of attacks, uh, it's a problem because when you're talking with nation-sponsored attackers, some of them are so skilled that it, they can come in and out in one hour. So they do all their homework before, they study you, they profile you, they understand your weaknesses, and then sometimes when they launch an attack, they can get in and out in one hour and you're not even aware of it. And we had cases, and it has been also in the media, where some attacks actually, again, nation-sponsored attack, lasted for four, five years. And the companies were not even aware of it. So those, this is the, the problem that you have, is that uh, you, when you're dealing with skilled cyber criminals, again, nation-sponsored, but also the classical cyber criminal, those motivated by the money, those guys are innovating. They have the skills. They are also upgrading their skills, updating their approach in terms of attack. And in the end, when they get to uh, the results, it actually motivates them to do it again and again and again. So this is with respect to, you know, what you ask about the nation-sponsored cyber attack. Now, in terms of fake news or, or misinformation, it's a big problem. We call that a bit of how do you do your digi digital surveillance? Because sometimes defamation, if you take as an example, on a company, it costs money. And uh, we've seen certain type of example in the past where there has been some fake press releases that were released uh, about the financial performance of an organization. And uh, the, the market share went down for a, for a few minutes, I would say, or maybe a few hours until there was an actual press release explaining that this is not it. But because everything also is based on automated analysis of data that's going of different type of information. So this is why we really need to first make sure that we understand uh, who's potentially um, talking about us as an organization, you know, as your leaders in your organization. This is the digital surveillance we talk about. In social media, unfortunately, today, it just takes, you know, one rumor and then the information spreads everywhere. People do not take the effort to understand it. And we've seen that, of course, the impact that it could have, it could have on campaigns or elections, but also it can have a big impact on organizations. And today, organizations, when they're talking about cyber threat intelligence, how can they understand what are the different attacks or the different threats that might come my way? One key element of it as well is what is being told around me in, in this, in this uh, social media sphere or elsewhere as well, so that I understand, is this information, you know, fair, clear, logical, or is that some misinformation behind it? Thank you. So, you know, I, you both have done a, a great job in kind of covering um, what some of the major problems are and what the impact is. So now I'd like to kind of shift to well, what can companies do about it? So the Biden administration's recent cybersecurity executive order encourages federal agencies in the United States to establish a zero trust relationship with their supply chain to protect data. So, and zero trust is like, if I understand it, is a set of principles used to build a security strategy. And it's founded on the assumption that your organization has already been breached. And I, I, I just read an article um, in the Financial Times that was written by a hacker and he put it 
this way, and I found it really fascinating. He said, there's this misconceived notion that the security arena is a battlefield. It's not, it's a chessboard, and it requires foresight and calculated pawn placement to protect the king, your data. If your main focus lies on keeping hackers out of your environment, then it's already checkmate. Your mission should be to buy time, slow the hackers down, and ultimately contain any attack. Do you both agree with this approach? Is assuming you've been attacked, distrusting everyone who's on the network, and then tracking behavior a sufficient defense? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. I mean, um, there, there, there are several other things to understand. The first thing is that uh, the, the technology is evolving exponentially, right? And, and, and uh, the, COVID, the COVID pandemic was pushing and speeding up digitalization. So uh, the concept of zero trust comes from the fact that in the past, similar to in to a medieval city we used to protect the data with walls and, and in fact we we hear the word firewall i bet you, you you hear that somewhere right everyone was talking about firewall and everyone feels more secure but when when someone says that there is a firewall in place and i don't know what they feel why they feel because they don't help much these days so the concept in the past and i am talking about two years from now, was to have a trusted network. So everything what was inside of the walls was trusted. And everything outside was not trusted. And uh, now, surprise, surprise, now we are all of us outside of that wall. And that's why we have to never trust and always verify. And 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 what is zero trust is more than 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 a philosophy. It is also a, a a technology, and it is a technological architecture that that we, for instance, at Siemens are are deploying as we speak. Now, I mentioned never trust and always verify. Now the question is, what is it that we are going to verify? And now I come to what you say, Jennifer. Number one is we are going to verify the, the health of the devices. And, and now it's, this is very similar to what's happening in the airports when you are traveling now. So you not always show your passport, which is actually, um, let's say, showing your identity. Mm -hmm. But you also show your proof of test or your proof of vaccination. With that, you are showing that you are healthy. So it's very similar to what we are doing now in the zero trust architectures with the with the help of the technologies. First of all, we are making sure that, in fact, you are Jennifer Schenker and you are entitled to access data. Number one. Number two is we are making sure that you are healthy or that your devices, whether this is your phone or your laptop or your robot in the factory or your MTR in, in the hospital, that this device is healthy to enter. And furthermore, and this is very interesting, we combine this information with threat intelligence. So we, we want to know real time whether, I don't know, uh, Natalia uh, was involved in a state situation. And, and, and now even, even when I can show that I am Natalia, I am not trusted anymore. So this is, this is very interesting and, uh, and uh, it's been deployed already as a reality for companies like Siemens. Uh, so we are, we are, yeah, we are using that, and um, and I was really very happy to see uh, what Biden was issuing, uh, uh, yeah, in the past months. Okay, thank you. And then let me now turn to you. Um, now I've read that you know sometimes you can fake identity, but behavior 
is more difficult to fake. So is tracking the behavior of the people on your network also a good way of ensuring they are who they say they are? Yeah, to, I mean, it's further a bit to what uh, Natalia was saying and the philosophy of zero trust. In the end, uh, we need to have a good protection and then we need to have a good visibility about what is happening on my network. So now your network is not longer, you know, the fortress, as Natalia said. Your network is a bit everywhere. Also, your network is uh, heterogeneous, it's very diverse. You have IoT devices, Internet of Things, you, have, you, have, you go to the cloud, you have edge computing coming as well. So. It's a, there's a volume, there's a huge volume. So you cannot just go and check it out in how we used to do it in the past. Mm -hmm. And also, as we were saying, you know, in this uh, checkmate, we're dealing with cyber criminals that also know how to try to remain in a stealth mode, you know, not detected. So they try to simulate what usually should happen in an organization. They try to simulate certain activities on the network. If they have compromised my laptop, there will be a simulation, it's, uh, you know, the malware on itself that will simulate also the type of the normal activity that you would expect from a laptop. But indeed, today, what are we doing? That we're going to implement artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to first accelerate the detection about what is happening in my network. I need to uh, understand, you know, the device, the user, the network. Um, and at the same time, I need to make sure that I am, what is happening, what all those exchanges of data, all this network flow is logical. What is the user trying to access is as well logical. And this is where artificial intelligence would start. It's not the only use case. Huh? I think it's very important to mention it. It's not the only use case. But this is where you can start by modeling the behavior, by understanding, for instance, Zena works in R&D. So if suddenly Zena wants to connect to the financial services or to the m &A, uh, servers where there are very confidential information, it, it shouldn't happen first if we have implemented zero trust properly. It should not happen. But if I did not imp implement this properly, then we will see that Dana is connected. Why? And this is how the behavioral analytic is, a, is an approach of cyber risks analysis. Is it normal? Is this behavior normal? No, then there is a risk is in considering a, a, link, a, a risky uh, behavior. And then we would check, okay, no, Zena has to do that because she's involved in an MA project, then the risk is go down. However, if I notice, for instance, that the connection of Dana from her laptop is not from her usual location, not from the country of residence, for instance, again, the risk goes up. So all of that, this is the approach of behavioral analytic. And if you want to do that manually, good luck. <laughs> and this is why we <laughs> leverage <laughs> we leverage artificial intelligence, because we need to be able to process this huge volume of data fast enough. And we need to work on this approach of behavioral modeling. Now, I would say also, I, um, I mean, we need to be very careful on the behavioral modeling and the baseline, because, you know, if you're only based on, uh, doing this behavior analytic with respect to a baseline, if your baseline at a starting point was a compromised baseline, it's not going to work. So this is why today also it's very, it's, I think we need to be very careful and we really need to have the proper people, the proper cyber data scientists that are developing those algorithms so that we are fine tuning properly this type of analytics. But again, it gives us in an approach where you've built those protection models, you've implemented your zero trust model, then you're going to detect, you're going to monitor to make sure that everything is going fine. And if you are dealing with advanced persistence threat or with a type of attack or even insiders threat, you should not forget that sometimes you have insiders that, um, that will try to steal information and sell it. And it happens more often than you think. So how do you monitor all of that by implementing this type of approach? And the third point, which is key, is the response part. You need to be able to respond fast enough. Again, if you detect if it takes you um, two days to detect an attack, then it takes you one day to be able to quarantine, response, protect, then you have lost, uh, you, you, you have lost your data, you, ha you have been compromised, and the data has been breached. So it's always, you know, um, I think it's, uh, it's more like you're running a marathon sometimes, you know, <laughs> so you mm -hmm. need to always continue uh, in this approach that I need to be able to continue on the same speed, make sure that I am really able to make, to, to, protect properly all this complex environment of my, my organization. So you've just done a great job in explaining how AI tools, you know, help um, help 
um, improve uh, company can help improve companies' response and and the speed of response. Um, we have now, um, and you both outlined how we now have um, the tech tools to do this. So why, in so many cases, um, companies end up taking measures after they have a breach, but not before? You know, what do you believe has to happen so this will change and we don't always end up locking the barn door after the cows have already gotten out? <laughs> You're, you're touching on a very important point, Jennifer, and uh, I, will, I will add to what you say. I mean, if you analyze the attack vectors that were used in the case of the colonial pipeline uh, attack, for instance, you will realize that uh, that attack would have been prevented with, with, very, with very few <laughs> controls. No, not even artificial intelligence was needed, right, Sandy? I mean, uh, they they use uh, a firewall <laughs> that was not updated and uh, weak credentials. That's it. So I think the very first things that companies need to do is to be aware of the cyber risk that they have and evaluate that, identify it, and evaluate that and. And in, in many cases, uh, accepting the risk is legitimate and, and, and companies can do that. It's not about spending millions of euros or dollars in defense or in protection measures. It's about understanding what are the critical assets? Uh, what can happen if they are not available or if they are, of the data is not, uh, uh, has no integrity? And what, what is it that we are going to do if an attack happens, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what we need to do is to increase resilience in the company. So, which means, assuming that an attack happens, how do we can recover fast? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I think the very first step, go, going back to your to your question, Jennifer, and, and that's that's exactly what what I don't I still don't see happening so I still don't see this awareness of the cyber security risk so I, I visit a lot of companies I visit a lot of customers Siemens companies many locations whenever I go and I ask what is your biggest cyber risk and someone answers me no worry no risk I I I, I, I cannot sleep after that visit anymore because I know they don't know and they haven't evaluated. Whenever I go and I hear, well, yes, we have a very old infrastructure here, a factory with a very old infrastructure. This can be a potential attack surface. Then I am... I am very much relaxed because I know they are managing the risk. So it's it's all about managing the risk, being aware of the risk. And this is the number one thing to do. Zena, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I'm fully aligned with Natalia's view. And I think, however, that also organization did the mistake that they did not integrate security by design. So they started their digital transformation. You know, in the past, the digital part of the story was not the core business. It was there to support the business. Today, the business is the digital. All organizations are, are giving us digital services. So this is, this is how they are making money. And it's core to their business. And yet, security was not implemented by design. And every time you think about security afterwards, it's going to be more complex. It's going to cost you more money, actually, than if you integrate it by design. So I think organization did this mistake in the past, and we've seen it in IoT, Internet of Things. We've seen it with the cloud, adoption of the cloud. And my view is that nowadays, I think, at least I hope, that uh, organization have understood that they cannot continue that way. They will be, everyone is a, a potential a victim of a cyber attack how you protect yourself in advance is how you will be able to react quickly and mitigate limit the impact and you know if you think about it imagine you know when when you, you are a young couple you buy a small house you know i don't have anything of value in it so a cctv maybe good keys it's good good enough 
And then afterwards, you know, we, we buy a bigger house or I have a Van Gogh in my house now. And then this one, I need to protect it differently. It's key for me. If I still have only my CCTV and my, my keys, then it's, you know, it's like I'm inviting criminals come and steal my belongings. Same things that we see with organization today. It seems to me that, you know, th there ought to be better cooperation um, between companies and also between governments. Um, and, you know, it's been in the news that in October, the White House convened a meeting, 30 different countries to talk about coordinating cybersecurity. Um, but also, is there not a, almost a, a um, responsibility for companies to kind of share what they've learned um, with others um, so that the same tricks can't be used by cyber criminals to attack uh, different countries. I know, for example, that the Biden administration is thinking about requiring companies to report to the government when they've been attacked. Um, and also they are uh, strongly discouraging companies from paying ransomware. Uh, so do you have do you have points of view on all of these things, the international cooperation, but also the responsibility of individual com companies to kind of declare when they've been attacked, explain what happened to them, and also to maybe refuse to pay the ransomware so that it stops being a lucrative business for these hackers? Yes. Um... The two topics that you touch is number one is the cooperation and the partnership. Uh, Sena was describing how fast are the hackers, how much resources do they have? They have money, they have resources because the business is lucrative. And uh, and, the, and therefore you cannot do cyber security by yourself and you shouldn't. I mean, and I am talking about the companies shouldn't do that by themselves and they have to stop trying to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we have done, and uh, Sena and, and myself, they, we are we are part of a partnership, a very big one. That this is called Charter of Trust. And in this partnership, we sixteen companies, among them Atos and Siemens, uh, we are companies committing to protect the digital society. So we are not competing in that partnership, and this is exactly what we are doing. We are sharing not only in indications of indicators of compromise. This is the technical word that we use to do what you expressed. Uh, mm -hmm. Which attacker did me did attack me? Which tools were they use? Uh, which processes? Whenever I am attacked, as Siemens, I go immediately with the partners and I tell them here. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, we exchange the solutions, the technological solutions that we develop. Uh, and we also commit to install measures like security by default. So Sena talk about security by design, which is to include security in the design of products. But we also make sure that whenever we make a product available to the customers that 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 product is secure by default so they don't have to deal with the many settings of don't share this and don't share that they can start using the product and the product will be secure and the other thing that we do very strongly in this cooperation is to work with the supply chain because mm -hmm. we have seen that in the case of solar winds we are dependent on the suppliers and on the supply chain uh, so in order for us to be secure, we need to be make sure that the suppliers, our suppliers, are secure. And we need to be sure that we, because we are suppliers of others, that we are providing the right security to the customers where we are supplying our products. So, yes, cooperation is essential, not only in other parts of the digital scene, but, but, but in cybersecurity is key. Thank you. Yeah. Zena, you want to add to that in terms of both cooperation at the governmental level and also uh, between between companies? Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with Natalia. And this is why we are the both part of this shuttle of trust, where you have partners, competitors, 
uh, working together uh, for to secure the digital society. For me, together is power. You know, uh, you cannot solve a global problem by going on your own. Even if you have the best resources on the on the planet, it's a strategic mistake to say I can do that on my own because you're gonna do it slower anyway than if you are to doing it together. But I think this is very important. And another thing that's important is also this collaboration between the public sector, the, pri the, the private sector as well. Um, you were talking about nation-sponsored uh, cyber criminals, for instance. Uh, we're talking about the IOCs that Natalia mentioned, the state intelligence. There's a lot of information that the public sector sees that the private sector doesn't see. There's a lot of certain threats that the manufacturing industry will see before the financial services, because the attack will start more targeting this industry, and then afterwards it will become more generic and it will target everyone. So when we, when we share this information, we help others uh, be ready. And actually, this is the problem, that today, if we're waiting until the cyber criminals, you know, knock on our doors, we are late, even if we have put the good uh, or the proper uh, controls. So this is, for me, I think, a very important thing. And we see it because if you've seen the EU cybersecurity strategy that was announced um, end of 2020, there is a big focus on collaboration, that a big focus on collaboration among nations, a collaboration between the public and the private sector. And I think, honestly, today, when I talk with uh, all my colleagues in this field, we see that everyone understands it. Now, how fast are we going to implement it? This is another story. But at least people understand now. Ten years ago, it was not the case. Now, really, people have matured and understand that together is power. This is how we turn the table on cyber criminals. Thank you. So, you know, even if we have better cooperation and we've got better tools because AI helps us to uh, be able to tackle um, more data and, and, and um, perhaps exert some more control, the bad guys also have AI tools. So it still amounts to a kind of cat and mouse game. You still have to stay one step ahead. And as everyone knows who is involved in innovation, in, in order to be truly innovative, you need diverse uh, approaches and diverse ideas. And this is where I really want to get into this whole idea of the lack of diversity in the cybersecurity sector. Today, it is mostly populated by um, white men. Um, how do, you know, how does this impact the creativity in the sector? What can we do to bring more women, more minorities, more different points of view into the sector? Well, in fact, diversity inclusion is needed. Uh, Saina mentioned the magic word, and you as well, you mentioned innovation. So we, we will not be able to deal with this problem without innovating. And studies have shown that diverse and inclusive companies are more innovative than others, and they are actually more capable to outperform, financially speaking. So, yeah, innovation is a need, and it is a need, especially as well in, in cybersecurity, because cybersecurity is... is uh, uh, includes a set of complex problems, and those complex problems will not be able to be solved from one perspective only. So you need really the Mexican, the German perspective, <laughs> the vegetarian perspective, you know, the gay perspective, the women and the men perspective. Now, talking about gender diversity, it, it's in fact the case that we don't have many women. So when when Sena and, and myself, we go to a cybersecurity conference, the good news is that the uh, restrooms are always uh, empty and we don't have to wait. Uh, because we are mostly uh, uh, very few women there, but very, very few can. Uh, uh, you can uh, count them sometimes with one hand. Um, now, of course, um, what I think, and Saina is going to t say what, what, what she thinks, but what I think is uh, we women, uh, we want to touch society directly. So careers like education, like marketing, uh, those 
those professional careers are really touching society or or uh, health, right? I mean, I I I can list a, a, a lot of them. Now there is this belief, I think, that technology is not touching society directly, and um, and I think in the case of cybersecurity, I I get inspired myself to do my cybersecurity job by thinking I have two, two kids that will that are using the digital world and they will be uh, using a self-driving car one of these days or maybe they are already using a self-driving subway somewhere in the world oh my god if I want them to be secure I need to secure this digital world you know so yeah. This is technology with purpose, uh, and the purpose is to protect society. So what can we do, Jennifer? Long answer to your short question is, I think the more ro role models we have, the better. And, and uh, persons like uh, Saina and myself, we are really committed to, to talk with women to talk about the advantages of cyber security, to ask them, to invite them, to show them. Um, and uh, I can think about a number of things to do to increase the share of women in cyber security, but I am mentioning what for me is the most important one, to touch them directly and show them what 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 nice and what a beautiful uh, profession it is. Cybersecurity. And what do you, you know, what do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, it's for me, it's a no-brainer nowadays. If you don't have diversity, honestly, in any field, you, you're not going to be innovative enough. We need this normal diversity, the cultural diversity, the gender diversity as well, in order to bring a solution that actually talks to the entire population. As an example, and in cybersecurity, also, we need this this diversity of mindset so that we can understand, you know, you were talking a lot about understanding the enemy, you know, profiling, mm -hmm. uh, talking a lot about how can we change so that it's not, uh, you know, every time they do something, I follow up, you know, the cat and mouse thing. So all of that, we really need so many different type of profiles and gender diversity is one of the key elements, of course, of that. Now, why we do not have a lot of women in tech and a lot of women in cyber, I think Natalia uh, summarized it also uh, properly. In my view, that people just don't know, don't understand. And for me, it's a problem in the educational system that we do not explain enough what are those new uh, emerging technologies, what are the new fields that you have. You know, I talk a lot with my friends who have kids that are uh, older than mine, and, you know, when I do this orientation, honestly, it's always the same classical, um, you know, career passes that they are proposing to the kids, whether you have a huge field of cybersecurity, of artificial intelligence, IoT, everything in terms of technology, that it's not very, very well uh, presented, or also sometimes uh, really it's presented in a way that it's no, you need to be the, the genius, you know, uh, with the highest IQ so that you can uh, work in this field. And again, because it's not only about IQ, it's also about emotional uh, intelligence and all of that. So I think we really need to explain better what are the different career paths that you can have in cybersecurity. I have been in this field for 20 years now. Uh, starting in security, you know, at the time it was network and security. It was more network than security because 20 years, there, there was the firewalls that Natalia talked about. This is this was the, best, the biggest innovation and antivirus. And you see where we are today with over 100 technology in terms of cybersecurity to protect organizations. So we need to explain what are the different roles that you can do. Some of them are technical, some of them are less technical in terms of advisory, the risk assessment model. So really it's a field that's open with so many different people. And we know that we need, we need to, to recruit people. You know, that you, ha you, you have millions of jobs that will not be fulfilled because we don't find resources, whatever they are, you know, whatever uh, culture, whatever gender, we have a shortage of resources. Yes. And what we're doing, I think a lot of organizations are doing it, and it's one of uh, also things that we're doing in my company, is that we're also uh, helping people change their career paths. You know, you started as only, for instance, on the network part of the story, uh, or even you were working in psychology, 
and you want to change your field, you were working in biology or just math, and now you come to artificial intelligence. You have so many different career paths. And honestly, think about psychology. We want to understand and profile the, the cyber criminals. What's better to have someone that has a psychology degree that then understands cybersecurity? So this is also something that we need in terms of recruitment. I think now organization understood they need also to recruit differently because you, they would usually, you know, when you, you, you see the job description for a cybersecurity role, we want someone that has 10 years of experience and maybe 20 cybersecurity certifications and degrees and all of that. I mean... And this will not help you have the best resource. You need to have someone that loves change because this is a field that changes a lot. So if, if it change scares you, then yeah, I would say this is not a field for you, whatever you are, man or woman. But if you like change and if um, you really like to feel for, fulfillment, because in the in a way we're securing the digital world, we're securing the digital society. It's, it's a great uh, thing to feel that I am contributing to something great like that so, and if afterwards the only thing that is scaring you uh, pushing you away is to say ah, i don't have this degree or i don't have this type of experience don't look like that if you if you go and submit your cv for the company that will tell you no you're not good because you don't have the cv or you don't have this uh, um this master's uh, degrees yeah. or whatever yeah exactly don't go there and go find another company because there are so many companies that really know that what do we need? And this is really this potential. We, we really recruit on potential. The people that have potential, that have the stamina, the, the enthusiasm to, to work in a field. And But again, for me, we need to explain what is cybersecurity. These people that get scared when they don't know what is behind it. And sometimes they think, oh no, it requires someone that has better expertise than me, which is most of the time not the case. So you've, you've touched on a number of super important um, points. So First of all, this morning I read in the Wall Street Journal that in the United States alone, there are 462,000 openings for cybersecurity jobs that need to be filled. So, you know, uh, if you multiply that, you know, around the rest of the world, obviously, you know, there is a huge need to get not just women, not just minorities, but just a lot of new people into this field to fill these existing um um, open positions. And, you know, I, rather than uh, where you, you have a situation, a lot of big companies where artificial intelligence is doing away with certain jobs, like, and so they are cutting people, for example, in uh, the accounting department, and laying them off. And then they're, you know, desperately searching for positions in cybersecurity they can't fill. So the question then becomes, you know, can we train, can we look for traits that can map over into cybersecurity? Can we train some of the employees, existing employees, to go into this job and look, as you said, for um, completely different sorts of um, training and skills that might actually help the cybersecurity field. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do, do you know of programs at large companies like that, or is it something that just really needs to get started? No, no. Uh, 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 Siemens at this moment is busy in doing reskilling and uh, making sure that we all, all of us, stay relevant in the future. And we all need to be thinking about changing, about growing. And this is what we call having a growing mindset. So we do believe that people can change. I am not going to stay with my skills and my talents in the way they are. They can be developed. So the, we do have uh, interesting programs in order for us to get out of our comfort zones. Mm -hmm. To give you an example, I am not a good communicator. I mean, because I am a technologist, I love to be sitting programming a Cisco 700, which was a, a very old firewall, by the way. I love it. I love it. I am no, I cannot communicate. I don't speak perfect English, not speak perfect Spanish, uh, sorry, German, and I even forgot my Spanish. So, and by me doing this communication, I am completely out of my comfort zone. So now I am learning. And of course, I do need to communicate because I need to explain the, the risks that we have in the company wise. 
Now, the other way around, for instance, uh, the people that write regulations, cybersecurity regulations, mm -hmm. If you, if you think about this role, the core function is not cyber security. The core function is writing in such a way that the people can understand. So someone like from the communication reporters, uh, you know, this is the core function. And, and we very often think that we need experts, 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 like, like, like Saina was saying. So, we are now changing our beliefs about what kind of talents do we do we need, number one, and changing our beliefs that a person cannot change and cannot be trained. Mm -hmm. So this is what we call in Siemens growth, the growth mindset. So we mm -hmm. think that we all can change. And I can tell you, now that I am doing the other role, diversity officer, oh my goodness, I mean, that, Two different words, you know, and I, yes, I am able to do the, my other role as well. So, yeah, that's very interesting because um, I think that going forward, one of the most important traits that anyone in the work world can have is adaptability. And that also is going to be an important thing in cybersecurity. <laughs> you constantly will have to adapt to new new forms of attacks, new technologies to combat them. Um, so embracing change and being willing to adapt is uh, is going to be important um, in this in this field. Um, it is very interesting, Natalia, that you have both titles of uh, chief diversity and cybersecurity. Um, Maybe you could talk about how that came about. And then I'd like to ask both of you, what do you see as the biggest challenge um, of being a woman in a senior managerial role and setting the pace for digital security in your organization and outside of it? <laughs> There's so many, Zena, do you want to, to start? Yeah, but just before that, Jennifer, because you mentioned, you know, when you were talking uh, before the, in your question about, you know, how do we reskill people and all of that, you mentioned that with AI, we are laying off employees. And the thing is that in cybersecurity, AI is helping employees. So cybersecurity is a field where we have adopted artificial intelligence. And yet at the same time, we are recruiting, as you mentioned, and we, we are not, we have a shortage of resources. Why? Because we're using AI to enhance the capabilities of our cybersecurity expert. And I think this is also something that we need to be, so we sometimes we look at technology as a, a scary thing that will replace us. It, for me, it's about really how it's gonna improve my life so that I don't waste a lot of time on things that can, can automate, I can leverage machine learning and focus on where the value is in my role. So I just wanted to say it because indeed I hear it a lot. And I know in cyber, this is a good example about how it's here to help and not to replace. But uh, further to, to your question, um, I think um, I, maybe I was lucky, I don't know, but um, for my side, in terms of what is the challenges that I see, the challenges that I face have, are not the gender related per se. You know? mm -hmm. My challenges that I, and my senior role are the same that everyone has. You really need to be convincing. You really need to come with a, with, with a problem and the solution to the problem. We need to have this vision and to to move forward. And one thing that happens is that, yeah, sometimes you notice it when, as Natalia was saying, sometimes you are the only woman in the room, but, you know, the first two seconds, you know, sometimes they're looking at you, are you legitimate to be here? But uh, you are. And so in two, two minutes, when you start talking, the, the, the question is no, not there. So my thing, only thing that I say that we really need to be confident and have this confidence about what we're doing. We, we have this place on the table. It's for us. I did not get this place on the table because there was some quota or because they had to put diversity. No, I got it because I was the right resources. I'm doing a hell of a job <laughs> on that, like all the women that are in this field. And for us, the only thing is we really need to have, to have this confidence. And sometimes when people just, you know, question, you know, they look at you about uh, this person legitimate, you know, whether because you are a woman or you are a minority or you are maybe younger than, uh, than what is expected. All of that disappears when you start explaining, talking, demonstrating that you know your job. 
at least if you're facing people that have the necessary emotional intelligence and and simple intelligence to know that well, this is how we move a company forward by having the right people in place. Thank you. And Natalia, do you want to talk about how you why you got those two jobs, those two titles, and how do you how do you balance them? You know, I, a little bit related to the other question, what is the challenges I would I am with Sani, I cannot picture any challenge that 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 was related to, to, to gender or something and, and completely the opposite. I can picture a lot. I was given a lot of opportunities. Uh, wonderful people that were giving me feedback and wonderful people that were always uh, offering a hand to, to, to help me. Uh, I, I am basically new in Siemens, so a lot of people helping me to introduce, to get introduced in Siemens. And, and the reason I am so happy I can have this other job is because now I can make sure that everyone in the company gets the same opportunities that I got to be included, uh, to be relevant in the company. I am rather an introvert. Um, in my culture, it's not, I am not, I am not person, not a person that can speak up. I need to be asked. And there were so many people that are asking me, what do you think? What's your opinion? And so many people that, uh, uh, that that invited me to contribute. Then now in my position of diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, I make sure that we extend these opportunities to everyone and that we develop this sense of belonging so that everyone can feel safe in the company and can contribute, especially to innovation. Now, how it came that, that, that I became diversity officer, um, I just say it, one day it would be wonderful if I could do something like this in the company. Uh, I I really wanted that, and uh, and one day it became reality, and I was so surprised that the fact that I was selected uh, because I really wanted to do that, and uh, and now the company. Uh, Siemens thinks that it is a good idea to have someone doing this topic in a in a in a in a unit like cybersecurity and not in a traditional unit like HR or or yes. someplace else. And and the reason of that is because diversity, diversity opinions and and contributions. Oh, that's why I managed to become this interesting position. Thank you. And I, I, I really want to thank you both uh, for being such formidable role models. Um, we're helping other women to move and, and uh, minorities to move ahead um, and for your contribution here today. I'd also like to thank the audience for watching and um, wish everyone um, a good um, evening or a good day, depending on which time zone you're in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Jennifer. Thank you. And thank you, Sina. Thank you, Natalia, Jennifer, and everyone who listened to us.